again, we've, um, the, the numbers are still going up slightly, but I think we'll make a start, if only because there's an awful lot to talk about, and I'm conscious of the fact that we've only got an hour. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll make a start to say, presenters for this morning, so this afternoon session are myself and Niall, who you can see on the screen, and it's going to be the usual format for today. So um, it's a quick welcome to the webinar. I'm going to take you through the, the first bit. Now I will take you through the, the bit in the middle and I'll do the, the close at the end. Um, we have a chat box available and we have a question and answer facility. Um, please, if you, we, we will try and if we've got time, take some questions at the end. And so if you've got any questions as we go through, can you, um, can you, can you place those? questions in the Q&A box. Um, and at the end, we'll give you, we'll sum up and close. And of course, the important thing for you, um, this webinar does have CPD accreditation for an hour. We, if you want a CPD certificate, it's info at asfp.org.uk. Um, we are recording this webinar and we will place this webinar on the internet afterwards so that if you want to get access to this after the session that's how we'll do it and we'll do it we'll so we'll do it that way um and but what we can't do is if you are watching this on catch-up tv we can't give you a, a cpd certificate we can only give that to those people who have actually sat here and watched because we're recording who's here and who's keeping an eye on us okay so i'm crashing on um we're going to talk First and foremost, we're going to talk about the Fire Safety Act the and the, the Building Safety Act, and we're going to do that. What's happened to us, a, a quick look back at what's happened to get us to where we are at the moment, and what's going to come with the building safety and regulatory, the, some of the committees that we see going, uh, developing over the next few years, and the gateways. Um, no doubt, uh, some of you will have seen in the last... Uh, in, the, in the last month, that toward, just before Christmas, the government produced a series of consultations, and Niall's going to take us through those as we try and galvanise our ASFP position. And then beyond that, we've got the latest consultations. I've actually, the, the, the thing there mentions competence and CCPR, but we, we haven't got really got time to talk about those. So I've, because there's an awful lot of stuff in the other bits and pieces, so we we'll probably won't talk, dwell on that in any great detail. And as you well know, we have poll questions that we run as we go through these things. And the first poll question, if provided you're not watching on a phone, the first poll question should hopefully have appeared in, in front of you, um, which is your the involvement, um, what's your involvement and what's your interest in being here? Uh, I can't vote, but if you could pick whatever your interests are there, at least we gives us a gauge of who our audience is for this session. Okay, <clears throat> and the answer to that says we've got a really an, a, an even split up from manufacturers and fire risk assessors, inspectors, installers, specifiers, architects, designers, in probably the most broadest um, split of, that we've had one of these sessions before. Right, okay, so without any further ado, let's get on with it and let's, let's uh, deal with the presentation. So this is the first bit. So hopefully you all recognize the fact that there are three pieces of legislation going through um, that are going through and being enacted on by government at the moment. Um, the first one that we went through was the Fire Safety Act, which received royal assent in 2021 to reinforce the regulatory reform fire safety order. And in actual fact, the secondary legislation, the Fire Safety England regulations, it, which is the legal implementation of a lot of that, will uh, goes live next week, 23rd of January. And that covers all sorts, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about what that means in a few moments, but that's those two bits. And then of course, the Building Safety Bill as was, became the Building Safety Act in April last year. And now that gives the government 
um, that gives the government uh, options to uh, make regulations and obviously we're waiting to see how they go forwards. So we've done the say the fire safety act we've done that was that was went through that brings uh, external walls and flat front doors as, as Brit into into common parts and so we'll wait and see with that and that's going to be implemented along there's lots of that stuff you know we we know that that's already done and the building safety act we know was achieved royal assent last in in the on the, in april last year and it's what we're now waiting to see with that is the um is the uh, sorry the I'm getting ahead of myself the fire safety regs implement next week and that puts in place requirements for responsible per persons in buildings with two or more dwellings. And there's stuff relevant to buildings of greater than 11 meters in height and stuff for high rise greater than 30 meters in height. Um, there's a series of guidance sheets on gov.uk, but this is the stuff about, about this is the things about um, checking layout, ch checking fire doors annual checks on, on front, flat front doors, more frequent checks on on um, fire doors, improved signage, improved stuff, and lots of information that needs to be provided to the fire and rescue services. Um, there's a lot of guidance sheets already available on the government website. And if that's something that's of interest to you and you're a responsible person in one of these buildings, then, then go there. You will find that information and you need to be talking to fire and rescue service about that sort of thing. Okay, so, so the Building Safety Act, Royal Ascent, April last year, which means now what we're waiting for as a result of that is what the secondary legislation looks like. And what government has said to us, and hopefully you've all seen this slide before, is that they are going to run a series of consultations on this. Um, so we, the bill receives Royal Ascent. Thereafter, there's some formal consultation on the draft regulations and the regulations get laid in Parliament. And we were waiting to see what government's time frame for that was. And they gave us about 18 months ago, two years ago, government gave us this slide that says, after Royal Ascent, this is what we're going to do. And the first thing they said they were going to do was extend the limit period of the old Effective Premises Act, which they did last year. That happened in June last year. And then they were going to do lots of actions at 12 months and lots of actions uh, 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 by 18 months after the bill got royal assent. And if we look at the at the 12 month stuff, um, they said they were going to to convene the resident panel um, to give residents more voices, and this would be a group. Well, there is a series of there's been a request by HSE to for uh, to have people volunteer for that. Um, with the regulatory reform fire safety order changes. Yes, that's the stuff we just talked about, the fire, fire order in, in England. Um, but the other stuff and the construction product stuff, certainly that's not happening under the same um, time frame that government may be expected. If we look at the 18 month stuff, um, the 18 month stuff, we can see on the, on the screen here, um, you can see on the screen here, we've got lots of stuff that, again, that, that we think is going to happen. The key one there, and this, because 18 months after Royal Ascent is October this year, and the key one there is gateways two and three coming into force. And if gateways two and three come into force, that's going to have a significant impact on our, T, on our tier ones, okay? Um, because that we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit more in a moment, but there's lots of there's lots of stuff there. The other stuff, the other th important one is the construction products information, and the construction products information um, is a, is is obviously that's one area where the secondary legislation hasn't come through yet, and so that's going to cause us that's going to be delayed a lot further. We think so. What do we know? What's happened? Well, the building safety regulator is is in, in post. They're they're there now. Um, they are uh, they they're doing what they're supposed to do, and they are working steadily away um, under the auspices of HSE. 
and their responsibilities were well known. We've talked about this on a number of occasions. Um, a reminder to people that the building safety regulator now publishes an e-bulletin every month. There's an example of it on the, on the screen there in front of you. And that's a, a really useful thing to sign up. Um, the important one that it mentions there on the bottom of the screen is the fact that the building advisory committee has had its first meeting. And that was one of the things that they said HSE would be setting up after um, around about 18 months. So that was meant to be set up by October this year already up and running and our own Niall who we'll hear from in a few minutes sits on that and, and can, is keeping us up to date with what's going on in those discussions. Um, so we mentioned there that, that Gateway 2 and 3 may go live in October 2023 and Gateway 1 has already gone live right Gateway 1 was um, permission to uh, permit permission to design gateway and, and, and get do the get because you've got outline planning permission gateway once you get to the gateway two you've got to have full um you've got to have full pl detailed plans to hse before construction can start um we did get a little bit worried about that because there was lots of information about um, what was necessary in for gateway two in the con series of consultations that government ran in October in, in uh, autumn last year, there were about 30 consultations. Um, there was no go, go live date for Gateway 2. We hope it'll be October next year. Um, and one of the issues that we were worried about was that required papers for Gateway 2 included a design and build statement. And we were we, now and I were worried because we thought that the original intention of Gateway 2 was full plans. And we did have quite a long uh, conversation with Chandru and other members of DLUC at, at, at the back end of last year to say, well, hang on, how does that, but we are assured that Gateway 2, um, that Gateway 2 will require full plans. Okay, so if Gateway 2 requires full plans, that should be an, an, an important step to in, sort of present it, preventing the design as you build it um, issues. Another significant thing that was being, um, another significant thing that was was in in terms of the regulations is the golden thread of information. Um, we believe it's we we believe from what we've seen um, that it's it's actually overly detailed. The proposed information that you would need to to make available to HSE and within your building is actually, we think is, to be honest, goes well over the top. We think it's beyond the golden thread. It almost becomes a golden rope, hence those pictures. Um, and there is def massive onus placed by the consultations on the client to collate and submit this. And there's a massive implication on the client to check the competence of all those involved in the contractual chain. So we're, we're seeing a, a drive of responsibility into the client. And there's a certain, there's an element um, from from what I've seen of that, um, of of seeing that that the responsibility is being placed that way, more it, there's as much about about making sure that if things go wrong, we know who's responsible, as much as as making sure that buildings are safe. But there we go. That takes me to poll question two. So. Poll question two, it was just a nice and simple one. Did you respond to the autumn 22 consultations, which is a, a, a multiple choice there? You know, do, did you, uh, were, were you aware of those? Okay. And how many have we got? So over half of you wasn't aware, weren't aware of them and didn't respond. 12% of you um, did. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Right. It's at this point that I'm going to hand over to Niall. And what we're going to do now is we're going to look at 
the uh, I'm, I'm hoping I'm going to hand over to Nala there. Is. We're going to look at, at the stuff going, um, the, the current consultations, consultations that government posted on the 22nd of December last year. Um, 23rd of December. Oh, 23rd. There you go. It was but, uh, who's splitting hairs about a day? Yeah. I would um, argue a very, good, a very good time to launch a consultation just before Christmas where nobody will read it. Something um, like that. But there right. we are. I'll, that would be the cynic in me coming out. Where, and where would you see that? Okay, there's four subject areas here. Uh, removal of recommendation for sprinklers in new build care homes, removal of the national classification system, uh, uh, trigger thresholds for more than one staircase in residential buildings, and a call for evidence for materials under 10.6 and 10.7. Probably number two is the one I'm going to spend the most time on, but I am going to address all three of them, um, or four of them even. So if we move on to the sprinklers presentation. Uh, currently, there are no recommendations in terms of a general, uh, there's a recommendation in general, regardless of building height. But there's no blanket recommendation. There's no statement saying you must install sprinklers, etc. However, there are some some trade-offs or allowances, as they call them, uh, within ADB, and they're listed there. Far doors do not need soft closers. Protected areas have more than ten beds. Individual bedrooms more than one bed. Now, our position on trade-off is, as you probably express, is best not particularly. We don't support them. Um, uh, we don't see that the introduction of one safety measure means you can you know let off on another safety measure so uh if you you know when we have our cars because we develop airbags we don't say well you don't have to wear seat belts anymore or because we bought an abs you can have ball tires it doesn't work like that so we're not keen on 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 the trade-off aspect um and there's another side on that is if the fire door doesn't have a self-closer then there's no point putting a fire door on it And he's shown ahead of me there. So the, the consultation uh, mentions has su supporting evidence for it. Uh, and here's some quotations from the consultation. Um, uh, really, they're not exactly, it's hardly a ringing endorsement. Research shows the sprinklers are unlikely to operate quickly enough to prevent death or serious injure the person directly affected, although it does apparently for the people nearby. Bring a cost effective for all care homes, most is damaged. Benefit was through the prevention of property damage. And I've underlined property damage. So I'll come back to a minute. The net cost benefit for sprinklers above 30 minutes, again, as a result of property protection. And I put the question at the bottom, since when did ADB consider property protection? Because it's all about life safety. Having said that, at ASFP, we, prefer, we, we would prefer that ADB look at property protection because that would mean more fire safety measures such as sprinklers and such as passive fire protection. But it, it's a bit, bit worrying about it. We're, we're, yeah, it's, it's not a very strong endorsement. Next slide. So our position on it is, you know, we, we support the introduction of sprinklers with a great fire safety measure and studies over the years show they're reliable and they work. But we're not happy about the trade off situation and that we don't think that's that's the right approach. But we can support the proposal, uh, but not with the trade offs and specifically the removal of fire doors. Now I'm going to talk about the removal of national classifications or good old BS 476, uh, which I think I'll be retired at before it goes, but you never know. And there's two areas here. There's reaction to fire. So we talk about classes like non-combustible, class O, class one, et cetera. And they're being replaced by the Euro classes, Euro class A, Euro class B, C, D, et cetera, and, 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 and so on. And in fire assistance, we're looking at the provisions in ADB, which are in terms of minutes of fire protection, being evaluated by the European test. And this has been the direction of travel for DLUC and the various uh, names it had before then for, for 20 years. So this is not this is not a shock. This is not a new thing. But you know, it, it, and a lot of people will say, well, industry's had 20 years to do things, but we'll come on to that now. Um, um, but there are some some issues of them, and the main issues are 
uh, the implication of using a, a classification based system um, as opposed to testing. Where do assessments fit into this? The severity of costs of testing and as a result of that, different passive fire protection sectors will have different views. Next slide, Andy. I've moved it, haven't I? Uh, no, it's not moved at my end. Wait, wait it's moved it. <laughs> Hang on. Oh, it has. Oh, there you go. Now you've gone, you've gone two now. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. I think it's to get the diag between the internet and that. Sort of. So, um, so let's look at a, a reaction to fire. This should be there should be less resistance to change in, in this case. The classification process to EM one three five zero one part one, which is the classification standard, is relatively simple. The tests are relatively cheap. I know there'll be people in the audience saying, "No, they're not. They're very expensive." Um, uh, and assessments are not really used in reaction to fire. And the severity of a test in terms of the most severe and the least severe is largely similar, as is shown by the RADAR2 program. And I'll talk about that in a minute. That's a, a, a research program undertaken by Warrington Fire Research on behalf of the department. But the severity is largely similar. And so industry and the reaction to fire has largely moved over to the European uh, tests already. Um, the 12 month probationary period, which is included in the proposal, is probably enough. It might need to be extended, but we think that's going to be OK. So we're generally in, in support of that. Next slide, please. So I mentioned RADAR2, but just a bit of background and history. RADAR stands for Research on Approved Document and Revision. And in the case of RADAR2, which was reaction to fire, there were back-to-back -back tests on 64 products. So we tested the products of the British Standard Test or series of tests that made up the class and then did the same with the EN. Well, it might have been the EN first and then the BS, but it doesn't matter. As I mentioned, the severity in terms of range and intensity is largely similar. And that gave rise to the transposition, which you see in the table there, uh, which, which has been used in ADB over a number of years. And it has to be said that both British standard and the EN tests are quite good at predicting behavior for the scenarios in which they were designed for. And I emphasize on this because I get concerned when regulators and other people take one small test and use it for something it was never really designed for. And that gives you rise to problems. So in the case of the scenario they're designed for, it's a small room, something called the ISO, small room. ISO is International Standards Organization. And the small room test is actually quite a large room. And there's a wood burner and you get a flash over time at a certain period, depending on the flammability and combustibility and heat release of the wall and ceiling lining. And the Euro class system was modeled to it and accurately correlates with it. So that was designed to do that. And that works well. However, if we look at radar two, ACM, that's aluminium composite type cladding products, were not tested in radar two. Uh, the cladding products that were tested were things like foam PVC barge boards and cladding boards and stuff like that. And subsequent tests have shown that some class O materials, which might call class O to British standards, might only achieve C or D, and in some cases E when tested the European situation. And you know, you, you know, you know what I'm getting from here. And, and that is, and therefore that's not suitable and that's a reason to move on as quickly as possible. Some will argue, and I'm not going to get into that here, that that, that change should have happened a long time ago, certainly pre-Grenfell. So as I say, plea for regulators, please do not use small scale tests, including the SBI, to do large scale uh, evaluations where the Fire conditions in terms of radiation and convective are very different. Next slide. Now, fire resistance is situation is a bit more complicated. Sorry if it's complicated. Uh, and and you, you've got four points there. The first thing I'm going to look at is the, is the implication of a classification only based test. The proposal talks about classes. Do you know we don't actually have British classes for fire resistance apart from FD30. We have 
performance requirements listed in approved document B in terms of minutes. They are not classes. And that's something. But when you talk about European classes, that's a very different thing. A European class is not the result of a test. It's the result of a test and other processes which lead to a via classification standard. Next slide, please. So under the British standard, we have a fairly straightforward. On the left there, you've got um, a, a flow chart, obviously. So you've got a couple of tests, for example, the British standard, and those test results can go straight down and give you and, and satisfy the provisions of ADB. I've got technical standard there. I've got to be thinking about Scotland at the same time. And where we've got gaps in the product range, where we need to interpolate or extrapolate, or most importantly, where the product is used in an end use application, not covered by the test report on a building site, we have assessments and expert judgment. That's the crucial strength of the British system. Uh, the supporting documents use those obviously test reports, a test report and assessment report. The assessment report and the organisations doing them are test laboratories, and again, and for assessments, test laboratories and fire consultants. And at the end, you've got the process there to show. So the BS system uses assessments to fill in the gaps. It can interpolate and extrapolate product ranges. It covers end use application not covered by testing. There are thousands. I would like, I would probably say tens of thousands done by labs in the industry. Let's look at the European situation now. So it's largely similar. But where you first notice is there is no assessment. You've got your test, which goes via your classification to your provision and ADB, or you can go through something called this thing called extended application. An extended application, it's not an assessment, it's rules, calculation methods, and agreed expert judgments written down in the SEND standard. It's a very rigid system. I'll come on to that a bit more. There's a whole load of documents go there. That's just aimed at C mark. You don't need to worry too much about that. But the similar sort of process will go with UK CA marking. And the organisations responsible are normally certification bodies and manufacturers. And then you get the process at the end. So the European system asks for classes. If we talk about European classes, there's no room for assessments. There's no room for expert judgment. In some cases, the extended application standards that I mentioned here have not been written yet. So you can only classify what you test. You want to make one bigger, you can't do it because you can't classify and therefore satisfy approved document B. In some cases, they're very restrictive. You know, a manufacturer makes, makes it to a range like this, he wants to assess it there, but the European, the EXEP standard is really narrow. It's not user. In some cases, the standards are, are unwieldy. So what you do, if we have this system based on classes, it will severely affect product availability in a number of different passive fire protection sectors. Next slide, please. So the solution, if, if we move down this European, if we go ask for tests only, European system that asks for tests, it's a kind of hybrid of the two examples I, I, I showed you earlier. So you've got your test, your European standards, no British standard testing, uh, extended application, classification, and that gives you your provisions of ADB. That's as before. But you can also use expert judgment or assessments to meet the provisions of ADB. The difference being, in this say, there will be no European classification. And this area would not be allow you to use that European test for example, for exporting markets, you could only use it here. And of course, since Brexit, there's a whole load of other complications, which Andrew will talk about at some point, maybe not today. So again, you've got the same supporting documents and the same organisations responsible. So it's a flexible system. It has room for expert judgment. There's a role for assessments. And you can bypass the sex app standards that aren't written, that are unwieldy or too restricted. And that should lead to no change to product availability. But I, I want to come on to test severity and the different market sectors later, because I know there'll be people foaming at the mouth there. Yeah. OK, so moving on. So I mentioned the, uh, this, the role of assessments and the implications of classification. Now we look at severity of fire tests and costs.
Um, radar 1 report, radar 2, I mentioned earlier, was reaction to fire. Radar 1 was fire as this similar thing. A load of products and constructions tested to BS, tested to EN to see if the classes or the performance period in ADB needed testing. There was a, the consideration at the time was if we asked for 30 minutes for a fire door to BS, we might ask for 25 minutes for a fire door to EM and have two sets of tables with different numbers. And everyone thought that was really silly and really, really difficult. What we found with radar one, and I ran radar one, was there was a reduction in fire resistant performance, typically five to 20%, with the average being about 10%. 20% Sounds frightening, but it's about five minutes on a half hour door or four. You know, it's not it's not like you're gonna lose half an hour's fire protection. It's it's a small percentage, a large percentage, but a small time. And therefore that would give you a lower class. So if you specify FD30, if an FD30 door tested under BS under the end, it won't make it, probably. So the implication to make the same performance, manufacturers will need to increase their products, maybe another inch you mess and strip, more thicknesses in terms of structural fire protection and so on. However, the good news of the project, the best, it was agreed that the best way to lessen the impact on the market would be to retain existing classes. And there was a clear view within the industry advisory group, which is the industry, DTR at the time, and, and ourselves, which was that in my case, it was Warrington Fire, they're changing the classification for confusion. Nobody's going to vote for lower fire safety even then. Uh, and that industry had identified the problems and they would rise to the challenge. Um, so our position on, on this one is, is the ASFP and, and ASFP staff, Andy and I have been working in for over 20 years on the development of of EN standards, which we generally think are more superior and technically. However, a I have concerns in relate in, to the extent a deal I have thought this through vis-a-vis -vis classifications as opposed to just testing. There will be increases in the cost of fire protection. We're working with our members to find out the extent to which the change will affect their business. And we know other trade associations are doing. And the 12 month transition period is totally inadequate with the back backlog on 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 uh, testing at the moment. So don't move on, Andy, because a couple of other other bullet points I'll, I want to mention. Um, you know, if we look at some sectors uh, such as doors, um, the uh, they've worked pretty much exclusively in British standard tests. They've done a lot of European tests as well. They're retesting and establishing a firm base on will be very experienced. And the third party certification system for many passive bar protection products, which have been encouraged by the ASFP and others, other trade associations, they mostly, a lot of them have been based on British, British standard tests. So we have some, some big concerns about there. Uh, the, okay, thank you, go on, next. Stairs in buildings. Now, single staircase is, is and there's an element of commonality in this point, as was the one with the sprinklers. Currently, um, there's no threshold for having more than one stair in new blocks flats. And there's concern over people building 50 metres and 60 metre towers with only one staircase for all the reasons we know um, that, uh, you know, you, can you get all the people down in time? You probably can. But what happens is you've got firefighting activities and people trying to come down and so on. And so the consideration has been a lot of discussion about having more than one, one, one stairway. It seems to be a good idea on the face of it. Um, most of these buildings will have sprinkler protection. So, and DLUC cites a number of trigger thresholds that they've already brought in, the, 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 the no more combustibles from buildings higher than 18 metres, sprinkler protection now down to 11 metres from 18 metres, and signage in, in new uh, residential buildings over 18 meters. And they conclude uh, proposals, of, they propose a 30 meter height for more than one stair. And they're also proposing a very short transition period because it's only going to be redesigned. It's, it shouldn't be there. Uh, you know, it's kind of thing, if you were starting from a blank sheet of paper, would you would you start with one stair or, or, or two? And I was thinking, I'm reminded of, 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 of the Irish example, well, 
you, know, you, you ask them for directions. Well, I wouldn't want to be starting from here. And that's the kind of thing where we are with this. Go on, please. But again, like the sprinkler one, they put some evidence in and supporting evidence. And it's a bit half-hearted. Is, is that possibly too strong a word? But uh, uh, they've got the evidence behind um, a second staircase is limited. Therefore, the illustrator now only has an indicator of the bit in, in um, you know, indicator of the benefits. The fire assessors have not been monetized. Illustrative activities are reduction in injuries and fatalities, improved evacuation strategy, disabled well-being improvements. It, it, to me, it's a bit like it's not an overwhelming case. It's a bit touchy feely if I if I if that's been too strong. And I said, mentioned these builders will be, be sprinkler protected, and uh, we will um, have signage on them. So it's not kind of our battle to fight, but we worry where it's a bit of a hint here that we're getting consultation by peer pressure and media and social pressure and, and, and policy made that way rather than by a rigid look at the evidence. And that respect is similar. We're fairly neutral, not convinced by the evidence. It's almost like they're not really sure they want to do it. Next point, please. Okay, this is my, my last slide here. And this is a call for evidence for materials included in 10.6 and 10.7 of ADB. And those who ADB anoraks will know this was the old 12.6 and 12.7 and the infamous filler word um, where the, the use, the, these clauses restrict the use of combustible materials that can be used in external wall. And there's a lot of ambiguity about the term filler. Uh, I used to make bonded boards for one point. I was working, I actually uh, owned a part owned a business making bonded boards. It's a long time ago. We never talked about filler, we talked about the core. Uh, and as you see from the slide, the illustration of it, which is from a very old presentation of mine. A DLUC is asking, is the revised text clear enough? Um, the new text is a lot better. I haven't put it up because it's quite a lot of work. Is is a lot better. It seems odd that they're asking us how to write the approved document. I think we now move on to the, uh, I think it should be whole question three. So okay. these are all going to be questions about about BS476 testing, should we move it, should we not, et cetera. Um, uh, and, and as you can see, that, that you've got multiple choice. Um, so uh, you've got poll question A, which is on reaction to fire, and poll question B. Uh, and as Andy said earlier, we can't vote on these, so we, we have no say. We'd be very interested to see the results of this. It will be because, of course, at the moment we're we're trying to to put our association's take on on these consultations and put them together. Um, and it's quite interesting. There's a number of different markets. We have a number of different market sectors which are affected to a greater or lesser extent by these by this proposed change. Um, I've met with some with some of our manufacturing groups that are quite exercised about this and some that aren't. And, and there are all sorts of strange implications there that you have, we haven't considered. We were talking yesterday about the fact that, that there's a, an implication, the maximum size that will be permitted of fire resistant ducts. And from that, you know, that's that's going to have an implication on ventilation provision within buildings at the time when we're trying to increase the amount of ventilation. And but equally, there's also an environmental impact in that the amount of power and energy you need to put in to run fans. So that's interesting from from both of them. It's yes, it, the, the, the predominant is yes, with a longer with a, a longer transition period. Um, in reaction to fire is a is a more spread um is a more spread vote than fire resistance i which i thought would have been the other way around i i i i've less of a concern about the the reaction to fire thing than the fire resistance thing but there you go that's quite interesting yeah i'd agree i'd agree with that anyway we'll see so but the support for national classes is higher in fire resistance than on reaction to fire which is kind of what you'd expect Okay. Okay. Right. Over to you, Andy. Thank you. Right. So with that 
go, go, we'll try and rattle through this last little bit to get to, to Q&A because we've got a few questions coming in. Um, so <clears throat> in terms of going forward with Building Safety Act, that obviously we know that's got royal assent. One of the, the key things for, for passive fire protection going forwards is what's going to happen to construction products regulations. Um, we've had um, we've had provisions for these, and and the, we've already had discussions with government in terms of um, the secondary legislation. They produced a, a draft secondary legislation on the in October 2021, but they've taken that down off the government website, and we are awaiting the next iteration. That was the legislation that contain provisions for safety critical products and we're waiting to see what that looks like and when that secondary legislation comes out we know there's going to be um, a consultation on it so that's why we think there's no way that this is all going to get done by October this year and, and, the, and the provisions come live October this year we've got some time we've got some time to come okay so um, so we, we know that the OPSS has been set up as construction products regulator. Um, we know that they're working with trading standards and they've got powers to rectify problems, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but they're only looking at product supply level. They're looking at stuff in, within manufacturer's factory gate. Is it the same as was tested? And are you only claiming performance, appropriate performance? You're not over claiming, not making misleading marketing claims. Uh, will be given a, a, a 10 million, they'll be given a budget. And we know they've already started looking into six key product areas, one of which was the performance of smoke control dampers and fire resistant dampers. And we've had meetings with them on that subject. The, um, the government, we, we gave us, it, when they produced that, it, the stuff on construction products regulations in 20, October 21, they gave us this as their sort of their their theory of how they were going to go forwards. Um, on the right hand box, you maintaining the existing regulatory approach for stuff that had a, an EU harmonised standard, which is now a designated British standard. Um, in the in the so that would carry on and be done as it was before. In the left hand box, you've got a general product safety requirement requiring construction products to be safe before they could be put on the market. And we'll talk a bit about that on the next slide. And in the middle slide, you've got this middle box, you've got this group of stuff that was, was safety critical, but didn't have a harmonized EN designated British standard, which covers an awful lot of the ASFP's product areas. An awful lot of things are in that list. And that there there was there was going we were going to get this safety critical. We were told there was a, there was a rumor about back end of last year that, that this wasn't going to come through, but um, again, we Niall and I had a, a couple of conversations with uh, senior dealer people, and they, 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 we were told that yes, safety critical will be there. There is going to be something there. It is going to come along. So we keep an eye out for that secondary legislation, which we hope will come out this year. There'll be a consultation on it, and we'll keep you up to date as and when that goes through. The one thing, the one area you you can look at is um, is these two new supports and standards in terms of product safety. And I've mentioned this. Um, this is this is the the general product safety requirements that OPS will S will be looking at. Are your products safe to bring to market? There is a code of practice. It's free to download from BSI and has been there for nearly a year. So please have a look at that standard seventy fifty talked about doing risk assessments on products to make sure that you've covered or that it's safe and it's safe for people to use. Um, to be honest, we've already talked a bit about this. This is these, this is the, the idea that for, for the, the stuff that falls in that middle box, safety critical standards, we're going to have a whole new suite of product standards. And that's that's what we're going, that's we we expect that. We're waiting to see there's going to be new regulation, new um, secondary stuff secondary legislation to cover this and we will be consulted on that and there'll be a series of discussions that's what it was proposed and sort of it looks like the same system as the the european system hopefully without um all of the the bureaucracy that can hold that system back and slow that system down but a lot of what we're waiting for 
is un going to be underpinned by a report that was put together. Um, government committed to reviewing product testing and producing a report on a review of, of construction product testing, and that that report would be um, would be collated by a guy called Paul Morell. He met with a lot of us in summer 2021, produced a draft report, and was still, it was allegedly going to be published in autumn 21. A number of us met Paul at uh, the London Build exhibition in November 22, I remember last year. And this, as far as I'm aware, there's still no sign of that report coming out. And that is, I think that's that's step one. So we're going to get that the Morel report followed by draft um, statutory instruments on construction products regulations, consultation as to what that looks like and how that safety critical thing element is going to be covered, and then then that will all flow through, and that's going to be flowing through over the next, uh, it's imaginable over the next 12, 18 months. One of the um, the other things that obviously caused us a bit of problems and caused us some some further issues in the run up to Christmas last year was the situation with UKCA marking um, and whether how we were going to transition from CE marking to UKCA marking. So it's it's fairly clear for a, a product where a, where we had a hen that same standard is a designated British standard. You can now go straight to to UKCA and you can do that. Um, but there's no secondary there's no secondary legislation, no statutory instrument to end the recognition of CE marking for construction products. There never was, and we were sort of in the run up to Christmas. Government's website says, says prepare for CE marking to end, it will do by then, with no statutory instrument to unpin, underpin it. Um, we, and there were lots of questions being raised. Ultimately, in the end, government has now extended, as a result, has extended the recognition of CE marking for construction products for another two and a half years to the 30th of June 2025. They, they are saying that the standalone secondary legislation needed to complete this, so it won't be done within the CPR, within the CPR revision for Building Safety Act. There will be another piece of secondary legislation covering this, and that's unlikely to be started in 2023. They've got the powers to do it through Building Safety Act, but it's unlikely to be done in 2023, probably because they're going to be concentrating more on the um, on the provisions for safety critical stuff, um, but it can happen at some point. We also know that that as part of the approved document, Regulation Seven text is going to need a major rewrite in conjunction with this. So there's a body of work that's going to be done there. That's going to be done towards probably towards the middle end of next year. Okay. There's still big issues around regarding the acceptance of EU test data when using ABCP system three. Now, fortunately for, for us as ASFP, most of our product families are ABCP system one at the highest level. So a lot of the stuff about the European, accepting European test data doesn't really apply. It's only when you're at system three, which are things like um, the gypsum boards and insulation systems are using system three. And there, there you have to use a, a. It's the lab that is the um, the, the authorised body rather than the rather than the uh, assessment body because the manufacturer does the assessments. So, so ABC system three. There's still some confusion. There's still a lot of discussions. On that. Okay, and that takes us to I, I one. I I usually try and close these things um, with well, some text. Um, from, and this text here is a quote from Dame Judith Hackett, who regularly puts a piece in the monthly health and safety exec bulletin. And this is from one that this is from her piece in the January bulletin. Um, and, and it's a call to arms, really, to, to for basically, you know, there's going to be a series of consultations going through consultations, trying to bring clarity to so that we understand where we're going and what we're doing going forward. Um, but equally with 2023 is is the year where we will see a lot of people moving forwards and hopefully stay. You know, it's the usual call to do the right thing. You know, don't wait. People are saying don't wait for legislation, do the right thing. An example of that is the is the 
uh, say product stuff past 7050, have a look at that and start to think about that going forward. Okay, so that's it. Um, um, you know, we, we, are, we are going to see significant changes occurring in 2023. There's lots of consultations going on. And as ASFP, we're trying to, to bring our, our body politic together to frame our response. And we'll be talking to people. I've got a, a meeting set up next week with a number of, of people looking at the, the vexed question of the, the 476 versus um, BSEN standards and compiling our a response to that consultation. I expect an awful lot more consultations to out during for the rest of the year. And I so say we will we will discuss these with you um, with our membership as we go forwards. Which brings us to Q and A. And we've got we've got about uh, we've got about eight or ten minutes left now before we we finish. Okay, I'll do a, do a few. I'll I'll do my MC. There's quite a few come in. Uh, let's give you first question. Um, a question about full plans. What do you mean by full plans? Can you refer this to the REBA stage? That presumably REBA planner works, mm -hmm. or it is ambiguous. Uh, well, I think it's now then. Um, technical I, full plans. I think is in effect is us all the way through to technical design. Is that stage five? It says, four or five, it's from memory, five. without having it in front it, of me. Without having it in front of me. It, in effect, it's it, in effect, the 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 lines, I think it was Norton 1 took you to Gateway 1, uh, 2, 3, 4, 5 took you to Gateway 2. You built the building, it took you to Gateway 3. Okay, all right. Uh, I'm now jumping because of the time. I'm not sure we have time for another one. We've got, got, a, one we've got about minute. five minutes. I've got, I've got I've got three from Ian Appley, but I've done, I'm going to answer one of them and try and pick them all up. We said the radar two showed that class O was not class B, but could be C, D, and E. It was a false transposition, as explained by Richard Millett. Richard Millett QC being a prosecution, the right word for the at the Grenfell Tower public inquiry. Um, yes, that's the case. The point I was lacing was the transposition that you had on the screen was the transposition from the radar two report. And I've since looked at two copies of ADB which have the same transposition. Um, the fact that it is wrong is or is wrong with some materials, which I would suggest, because I, I saw the actual raw result, uh, is is important. Uh, but I was trying to show the difference, but you know how the transposition was was achieved. Um, it's a good support for moving from the BS to the EN test. And the other point to mention is part of these. Why is it wrong? It's rather wrong because the test used to use class O, the BS476 and BS476 part six and seven are very different and measure different parameters from the SBI uh, and the small recognizability test and other tests that can go to back up the Euro classes. Um, but yeah, it's important in the point of Grenfell, I think, because if this change has been made earlier, we might be in a very different place. Okay, next one I want to do is a uh, question. In the case where there are no XAP standards or they are too unwieldy stroke restrictive, what is done in the rest of Europe to manage this if no expert judgments are allowed? I'm um, leaving that one for you, Andy. Uh, thank you. I, the, the, my simple answer would be uh, experience says they don't build it that way. They don't, they try not to build the complexity into these things. Um, I, I give my example in answering that the um, we've just completed in the last 12 months, we completed an XAP standard on combined penetrations where a duct or a damper is in a service penetration alongside pipes and cables. And that standard nearly failed going through the same process because Germany voted against it because the German take on it was, why do you build it that way? Don't build it that way. And, and so the, the simple answer is it, we, the buildings do not get built with the same same level of complexity that maybe we do. We sometimes get in the UK. OK, thanks. Uh, and another one to this question. This is an interesting one, which I hadn't considered in, in this development. Do you know if the intention is to remove the national classification standards from other routes to comply, such as BS 9991? Be a double nine nine nine. 
Surely there will still be a requirement for technical assessments under fire engineered routes. That's that's really quite an interesting one. That's an, there's an, no, there's an interesting that, point. That's fascinating because if, if ADB removes national classes and then you've got engineered routes via 9991, still using national classes. That could be confusing. I, I, I would imagine that that's a very good I, question. Bear in, bear in mind, this consultation is fresh out from government and so no decisions. That's have a good prepared. question. In fact, if that's a, that's a good question we should that's, put in the our response to the consultation yeah. that's actually yeah it's a really good question i would imagine bearing in mind deluxe sits on fsh 20 i will we'll say 24 what whichever the, the fsh that deals with the double nine series um that that government will probably turn around if we do that and, and lobby BSI to remove national classes from 9991, 9999, etc. Et okay, uh, moving back up, I've got uh, sort of another one here. It's Niall. I understand that EN classification 13501 parts do not remove the requirement for testing. They are just different fire resistance tests, for example, EN1364, etc., etc., instead of BS476. Yes, but classification takes into account the results of testing and any extended application, which is a, a, a extension of the scope of the test result based on rules, calculation method, and expert judgment. Uh, so it doesn't remove the requirement for testing, that's correct, but, and the tests are different, but there's more to it than that. And you also got to consider that classification standard as it sits, it call, tells you which test standard to use. And one of the issues with the, the classification standards is that the test standards can be changed, but Europe wants dated standards referred to throughout the contractual chain. So just the, the standards change. So just because you change an updated the test standard, it take, can take you a while then to change the classification standard. So, so that the classification standard points to the correct version of the test standard. And there's, there's an awful lot of administration involved in using classification standards. And as you say, the, the limit of the scope that you can claim with that classification letter, the R, the E, the I, the W, is, is li limited down to diapanexat. OK, uh, I've got, uh, I think we've time for one more. Uh, anonymous attendee, at a very high level, what are the prime implications for intumescent coatings of the changes discussed today? That's definitely one for you, Andy. Um, at a primary level, I would imagine, as you mentioned in your in in the slides now, intermesic coatings are one of the areas where you're going to see loadings by changing from four seven six uh, to thirty em thirteen three eight one type. Loadings are going to go up by about fifteen twenty percent. You may see some loss in scope at um, at the the top end. Um, so the, the high section factors two hours, possibly 90 minutes. I don't know whether that's different manufacturers will have, have different uh, positions. I would imagine the vast majority of our, our manufacturers already have both approvals because they will be selling into the UK and into Europe. So there's not necessarily a time cost or an or a, or a, or a, a, a extra testing period needed. But there will be an increase. This will be an area where there will be an increase in costs to construct. So um, that would be my take on it. But I say we we're planning a meeting for next week, and I'll probably get more more sense hopefully from people as to whether that's the case. Okay. Okay. It's now one o'clock. You want to wrap up? We yeah, finish? we would say we've got we've got there's there's about a half a dozen questions still left to 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 look at which um, we can if we get a chance we'll have a look at them and and pull them um, whatever and a reminder that, that that this is available will be placed available on on through the SFP website to watch if you want to watch it on catch up but we can't do a, a CPD cert. If you do want a CPD search, info at asfp.org.uk, and we'll get those out to you. Um, and then beyond that, he says, just a couple of, of uh, bits of housekeeping for future. Um, our next um, exhibition is the Fire Safety Event 2023 at the NEC. 
and that's in April 25th, 27th of April. Uh, I'll be there, I'm sure now I'll be there for some of it. Um, so please come and have a look. We've got our brand new passive fire protection area exhibit, which is the roadshow trailer will be out there. So come and have a look at that. And then beyond that, our next in-person event is on the 14th of March, where we're running a regional event on the wrong side of the hill in Leeds. Um, so I, that's me having to get up and get my passport out and get over the M62. Um, and we're looking at best practice in passive fire protection in terms of design and installation. So come along and register for that and, and we'll see what we are doing. Uh, beyond that, thanks very much for attending. And we hope to see you at a webinar, our next webinar at some point in a couple of months' time, I think. All right. Thank you very much. We'll Thank you very much and goodbye. And we'll see you all soon. Bye bye.